Can I take any questions? Oh, yeah. Sure. Is, it, is, is anybody... We'll be happy to take some questions. Isn't everybody hungry and tired? Uh, or would you, would you like to have that as a coda for the evening? Please. Questions? Mark Lovendale, researcher, Preventive Care Institute. Uh, the Cosmos series, I think, is an excellent example of how to get science out to the public. And we're in a situation where, as brought out in this meeting, where in this country, 53% of the people think that the world is around 6,000 years old. And, and somewhere over 60% of the people feel that, just have great trouble believing in evolution, as explained by Darwin. And, and in this country, we have this problem partially because of how powerful the religion is, but th those, those numbers are also an indication of the failure, absolute failure, of the K through 12 educational system in this country. And the Cosmos series helped to get around that by, because the kids watch television. There's been other suggestions for getting around it. Milton Friedman came out with a system of a voucher system for schools that were non-religious private schools. And I wonder what your thoughts are for additional documentaries. I know Richard Hawkins, <coughs> Dawkins could have one in England that, that had a great impact there. And how can we get more of that type of thing on our television here to follow on the Cosmos type series? Well, it's a very good question. I mean, I think television is a reflection of who we are. I, mean, I don't believe that, uh, that you can bring about the kind of change in the way that the media is or the way that our entertainment is uh, except through uh, awakening as many people as you possibly can by, you know, everyone in this, in this room has the power to communicate and to inspire. I've seen this now. And um, I think it's, you know, I think one of the tragedies of the scientific community is that people like Carl Sagan were persecuted for trying to do public education. Their scientific credentials were called into question. A guy like Carl, you know, who made some real scientific discoveries, who helped with others to pioneer whole fields of science, who was absolutely fearlessly interdisciplinary and, and willing to go on The Tonight Show, willing to, I think, willing to publish in Parade Magazine or any place where he could reach as many people as he possibly could. I think that that's what scientists have to be willing to do, but I also think that the community of science has to foster and encourage their colleagues to do such things. There can't be a penalty for, uh, for public education. It should be a value of science. I mean, the thing that the religious community has so brilliantly down, as has been pointed out by other speakers, is human social organization. And, you know, I'd love to see every planetarium, every planetarium in this country, one night a week, to have local scientists come and, 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 and do some kind of, you know, wonderful exploration that's accessible, no jargon allowed. Use the images as Neil did so brilliantly, as Carolyn did so brilliantly. Did you feel when Carolyn was doing her talk and showing those slides, that spiritual uplift that people felt? I mean, I think the previous speaker had been giving a very jargon-dense talk, if you'll forgive me, about something. And there was a kind of a, you know, a valley of energy. And then Carolyn came on, and that image of Saturn with the tiny one pixel Earth and those the rings of Saturn, gravity's rainbow, beautifully portrayed in that magnificent picture taken by a spacecraft. Well, let me ask you a question. How many people in the United States who paid for that picture ever got to see that picture? Why? I, it, there's, a, there's this tragedy to it. Or for instance, in movies. Um, Think of the genius of our ability to simulate reality now visually, the verisimilitude that is possible in motion pictures. 
think of our special effects gifts, and then think of how many times you've sat in a movie theater and saw those special effects utilized to depict the revelations about the cosmos that have come to us from modern science. And then think how many times those special effects have been used to blow up an automobile, or to blow up an airplane, or to blow up a city. It's unbelievable. If you were, you know, it's like us, it's like us looking at the Aztecs who, and saying, how could they rip out people's beating hearts? You know, didn't anybody realize, was, didn't they have any degree of self-consciousness and realize how absurd and horrible that was? Well, I think if someone looking at a future time looked at us and looked at how dependent we are on science and high technology and how alienated we are about science and how little we use our gifts to, to promote the scientific enterprise, they would be, I think, would be very shocking, very stark. We, there's one thing that Roger, we came together about C-SPAN, the science. There are, I don't know how many God channels there are. I mean, I, you, I, how is it God that knows. these guys can put on a God channel, 10 of them, or how many? There are, there are golf channels, as you, you name them. And, and there isn't... We haven't got one channel yet. This is the culture that created this and, in fact, underpins everything. It, we right. underpin the bombs and the aeroplanes that they're that using to destroy us. And it just seems incredible that we can't just have something that we're very cheap just going around a conference here on public understanding of science. This sort of conference should, be, should have been out today, straight as it was, and it probably will be out there. And yet, where, I mean, it doesn't seem to me very much that we should go to all the people from Gates and for, uh, et cetera to say, look, all you need to do is just get the, give us a channel, give us the money for it. I haven't got it. I mean, maybe the Templeton Foundation has it, and we can get, get, it, get it out there. And I don't think that's very, very much to ask, and it's not very much to achieve. I mean, in my, I, in my little way, just one guy, I've made 110 television programs. 55 have been shown on the BBC, okay? We get one, uh, uh, half a million viewers for our careers programs. There are people out there who want to know what we do, and I think we can do it very easily. We just need the will and the sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, power of people like you and others in and other the eloquent speakers out here today. Let's go for it. I mean, and, I mean I'll, I've got 10 quid somewhere to start. We shall be putting that speech to good use, Harry. Don't worry about it. Terry, you want to say something? Well, uh, um, I'm heartened by um, the efforts that you're putting into it and all of your good work. Uh, but, you know, it's a drop in the bucket sure. um, compared to, like you say, the, the enormous uh, industry that's out there, entertainment industry. Um, that gives us a few sound bites now and again. And, and uh, I'm sure all of us here have had the experience of you know, being interviewed for an hour and then they're waiting for that, those two words to come out, or you know, a, a sentence or two. And then, of course, it gives a completely wrong impression to the public. Now, in other words, we're being forced through a bottleneck that is so small in terms of the bits of information that there is no hope that we'll ever be able to get across anything, let alone anything as complex as the things that we're discovering in science. But not only that, but you know, what we're talking about here is a, is a scientific version of C-SPAN, which is a wonderful thing. But C-SPAN is watched by people who are curious about current affairs. And I think what's needed is something much more of lavish than that. I think we need to have the visual and we need great music. We need uh, production values. We need to be able to compete for attention with some of the other things that are on television because what they're doing is they're just pushing the same buttons over and over again. The idea of jeopardy, the idea of violence, the idea of sex. They just use those same buttons and they get a huge audience. What we're trying to do requires a little bit more uh, on the part of the viewer. And so we have to give them more. And that means that we have to be able to visualize the amazing findings of science in such a way so that people are attracted to them. 
I, I think the ideas are paramount, though. The, the, you, you could have the NASA channel there, which shows you wonderful images all day long, but it eventually it just becomes wallpaper for people. So I think it's what's important, what we've been trying to do, at least, at least in these initial things, and certainly with a conference like this, is to deal with issues at the intersection of science and social policy, where they affect people's lives, affect their children, affect their health, affect their well-being, and make it a gold standard source of information for them about those kind of issues. Uh, as, as Carl said, you know, for, it's suicidal to have a society dependent on science and technology in which hardly anybody knows anything about science and technology. May I just say one brief thing? I, I, I want to mention uh, Carl's new book, which is the Gifford Lectures of 1985 that he gave, called Varieties of Scientific Experience. And I had the honor of editing this book and writing the introduction. And um, I just want to, you know, maybe this is a good way to end this discussion. Um, in looking through the archives, uh, uh, Carl's archives are voluminous, thousands of, of files, file drawers, literally thousands, not hyperbolically, but literally. Um, the first 40 years of the space age, but also because his mother knew what a great person he was, he was even as a child, she saved absolutely every one of his notebooks. And um, it's very clear that Carl Sagan was who he was when he was even just a very small boy. But um, in f looking for the, the files, through the files, to find the Gifford lectures, I came upon Carl's transcription, and just to maybe tie this whole thing together, of uh, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz's a uh, very famous quote from Principles of Nature and Grace. And of course, uh, I know you all know that Leibniz was uh, the mathematical and philosophical genius who invented differential and integral calculus independently of Newton. And Leibniz argued that God should be the wall that stopped all further questioning as he famously wrote in this passage from Principles of Nature and Grace. Why does something exist rather than nothing? For nothing is simpler than something. Now this sufficient reason for the existence of the universe, which has no need of any other reason, must be a necessary being, else we should not have a sufficient reason with which we could stop. And just beneath this typed quote, Carl wrote, to Leibniz and to us, so don't stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for your attention and contributions again today.